Good morning and welcome to those who are joining us online. Um, my name is Eileen Barron and I'm moderating our session today for the Move Utah webinar, where the rubber meets the road, active transportation and the I-15 tech corridor. We're gonna give folks just a couple minutes to log in and join us uh, before we get started with a panel presentation today. I want to welcome everyone who's tuning in to our Move Utah webinar this morning. Uh, we're just going to give folks a couple moments to join us and get their uh, audio adjusted or um, get their cup of coffee or a glass of water here before we jump in in just another minute. Okay, since we've given people a couple of minutes to um, join in, I thought that I would give just a brief overview of the Move Utah program. My name is Heidi Goodhart. I'm the program manager for Move Utah, which is a planning program operated by the Utah Department of Transportation and sponsoring this webinar and future series uh, in the months to come. So we're really excited to have you join us. Uh, the Move Utah program has always been focused on fostering active, healthy, and connected communities through active transportation planning, implementation, and walking and biking initiatives across the state of Utah. So, um, you know, we provide lots of community support, technical assistance, and planning um, kind of work across the state to local communities. And we really want to help foster collaborative environments that accelerate walking and biking uh, all across the state and in communities of varying sizes and places. So um, that's kind of an overview of the program. You'll get to get a sneak peek of some of our work and some of our partnerships across the state. Uh, on your screen, you should see a lot of our Move Utah partners. They span everyone from law enforcement, Department of Health, our MPO, our Metropolitan Planning Organization partners, um, and then UTA and uh, many more. So um, all of these partnerships really help us conduct the planning that we need and um, you know, that, <laughs> that we're trying to accomplish across the state to elevate our quality of life and give everyone mobility options that we so desperately need. We'll be doing these Move Utah webinar series uh, over the course of the next few months. And so this one's kind of our, our second kickoff and you'll see these webinars available kind of monthly to help kind of replace our uh, Move Utah Summit, which is usually happened in the fall. And so knowing that we can't gather together, we're going to be gathering virtually for these webinar series. So we hope that these provide an opportunity for you to learn more about planning, how to accelerate biking and walking in your own communities or in your own work, and also to understand some of the work that we're doing. And um, we'll get to get a good taste of that with uh, the project that we're featuring today on the I-15 Tech Corridor. So I'll kick it off to Eileen to introduce herself. Uh, she's also a UDOT um, member, so, and we'll be moderating our panel discussion today. Thank you, Eileen. 
Yeah, no, it's my pleasure to be here this morning. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Eileen Barron. I'm a Strategic Communications Manager uh, at UDOT for our Planning and Investment Group. And um, actually had a chance to work on the early planning stages of the I-15 Technology Corridor Project. And so it's really exciting um, to see uh, see the construction project come to an end and see now how people start to use and um, uh, the, the new infrastructure that's there, both in terms of vehicular traffic and connections with the local network, but also connections to transit and the Front Runner Station in Lehigh, um, along with the pedestrian and bicycle facilities that were constructed as part of the project. So today we're focused on uh, those active transit transportation components. Um, when we say active transportation, we're talking about pedestrian and bicycle use um, of the network. And um, our webinar today, we're gonna focus on the planning components and collaboration that it took um, to implement this project. Um, just a little bit more background about I-15 Tech Corridor. Um, this project was more than just a freeway widening. Um, we needed to, to look at a network integration and the network being both the roadway network from freeway on the local roads, as well as the transit network of how we could get people to their final destinations from the front runner station um, there in Lehigh, um, as well as active transportation network, um, which we're gonna hear more about. Um, at UDOT, we wanted to support local plans and really think about the Tech Corridor project, not just as a freeway widening, but as a corridor and a regional network um, facility. And that's reflected even in the name of the project that we called it the Tech Corridor project and not a freeway widening project because we wanted to address all modes and think about that network connectivity into the local and regional systems. So we saw the opportunity to support transit use and encourage short trips by walking and biking. Um, the Tech Corridor project runs from North Lehigh and Timpanogos Highway or SR92 um, down to Lehigh Main Street. And um, this area uh, is heavily used by the area known as Silicon Slopes. It has a lot of major employers. It has retail, restaurants, entertainment, um, a lot of destinations, both for work and play. And so um, our UDOT leadership challenged the project team to include transit, pedestrian, and bicycle users in the project design. And in order to help that team really stretch our imaginations, we invited Smart Growth America uh, to facilitate a workshop early in our development process, really to um, think about the possibilities and um, importantly, I think you'll hear from maybe multiple panelists, um, a key part of that was our experiential learning by getting out and walking or biking portions of the project, just so we could have a better understanding of what it was like in the current conditions to walk or bike, say from the transit station to a major employer on the other side of the freeway. And that experience really, I think, shaped and informed um, the resulting design. So our first panelist is Heidi Goodart. Um, she works for UDOT as our active transportation planner, and she's going to tell us a little bit more about the active transportation workshop that helped really um, ignite the imagination of this team. Thanks, Eileen. Um, so I'm just going to zoom in a little bit. This is, uh, you should be looking at an aerial of the SR92 and I-15 interchange. And um, if you look on kind of the bottom half of the you know, horizontal roadway, SR92, you can kind of see a little bit of a trail wiggling through. There's some pedestrian ramp crossings of the on or off ramps. And it kind of goes under the interchange or under I-15 and then wiggles through with some more crossings. Um, these were the existing conditions of kind of the Murdoch Canal Trail. And as it kind of crossed this area and um, you can imagine if you're a trail user and you're having to go and push a button and kind of wait for an opportunity where vehicles are actually stopped with the signal to then safely cross each one of these little legs, um, the amount of time to get through here was pretty significant. Um, 
when we were hosting the Smart Growth Workshop, we wanted to make sure that we were putting ourselves in the user's experience when they were walking through uh, this interchange. And so we sat down, we looked at all of the, you know, connecting roadways, major elements first as a part of this, this project. And you'll see Terry Newell um, standing here next to the presentation screen. And she really challenged us as a part of this workshop to think bigger, right? Our transportation infrastructure sets the tone for the rest of our lifetimes. Um, you think about the design life of a, of a bridge, for instance. We're not going to be going back and needing to replace that <clears throat> um, for 75 or more years. And so um, if we build something, we need to be thinking very strategically about all of the impacts and the users and how to intertwine them within the system. So we sat down, we started brainstorming, drawing, what does this area need? What's the future coming with plans with light rail? And how does Lehigh want to develop? How are all of these buildings going to be interfacing with parking lots, with sidewalks, with restaurants? Um, and you know, what are the things that we need to consider as we're embarking on this collaborative planning and design process? So we went out, we put our feet on the ground, we walked through that interchange multiple times. We walked through the surrounding land uses, through the parking lots. We looked at connectivity issues, lighting issues, landscaping needs, um, kind of all of these things. And with our feet on the ground, we came back and we started brainstorming. We threw massive ideas out on the table, um, you know, because if you throw something big out, like capping I-15, uh, similar to the Boston Big Dig, right, then it doesn't seem so crazy to have a pedestrian bridge, for instance. And so we were throwing out all of these solutions, everything from um, doing nothing and just adding lanes on, on I-15 to really taking an opportunity to realize the potential for this area for walking and biking and the quality of life that we could kind of round out this freeway project. So um, you're going to see kind of an overview of what this project has become. So we'll see a, a short little guess and you can go ahead and, and play that. <clears throat> And I'll just talk during this. So this is a little bit of a GoPro preview. It's ridden on a bike. So you'll probably see uh, some, of the, some of the turns in a second. But the green is an overview of what we're going to be seeing. And this is a new grade separated crossing of those on and off ramps um, in the corridor. We go under I-15. We loop around on this really cool ramp that's all ADA graded. Um, so it's really easy for people in wheelchairs or that need mobility assistance. And it connects into frontage road, um, frontage road trail systems that are span the, um, the length of the project. So not only did we improve the crossings, we added miles of active transportation trails on each side of I-15 to help improve walking and biking connections. Um, there's a huge bridge that was incorporated that didn't exist prior to this project on Triumph Boulevard, and that has uh, incorporated within it trail access, connections over the bridge, back under. Um, so this project, as you can see from the video, put down a lot of pavement for active transportation. And, you know, the design considerations with comfort, with crossings, with connections to the incoming businesses. There's a lot of development that's happening fairly rapidly in the I-15 tech corridor area. And this trail helps provide mobility options that weren't there previously. So it's really exciting to see these high comfort trail facilities interface within the transportation system to provide people safe and comfortable ways to get from point A to point B. So these trails, and you'll see a little bit more from photos and kind of our discussion further in this, uh, in this webinar. These trails are great because you don't have to be a road warrior or like a fear, fearless like bicycle rider or, you know, taking your, your life in your own hands to walk and bike through this area. Um, a three-year-old on a Strider bike can easily and very safely navigate this trail system and go through the interchange without worrying about, you know, tipping over and suddenly being in the way of an oncoming truck or a vehicle. So we're really excited for this trail system and how it um, provides just this really awesome infrastructure that's going to be an amenity for the community for years to come. So I'm going to pass it off to Jim Price, who's um, kind of the godfather of trails in Utah County, and he's going to talk about kind of some of the planning work 
that he put in prior to uh, this workshop. So go ahead, Jim. Muted. There you go. Uh, Jim, Sorry, Jim, you're, you're still, still muted. muted. Am I unmuted now? Yes. Okay. My my wife likes wishes that I had a mute button. <laughs> she would uh, that would that would do uh, much for our relationship. Um, my job with the uh, MPO is to coordinate planning and project uh, development and construction uh, between the local entities, the local cities, the county, UDOT, and uh, the Federal Highway Administration. And so we, we have many, many, many partners working together with us on these projects. We've been working toward, do you have that um, photo that we can show here? Thank you. What you can see here is a just kind of a zoomed in photo of the existing facilities that are on the ground right now in uh, Lehigh. The center of that running kind of northeast and south or northwest and southeast is what Heidi was just uh, showing us on the ground. The trails north, north and south along I-15 and across I-15. We've always called I-15 the Great Wall, the Great Barrier, the Impassable River, because it, tend, it has tended to, in the past, divide east and west communities, east and west, uh, as far as bicycling and uh, pedestrian crossings, uh, because getting across I-15 is nearly impossible. That's why this project was so important to us, is it allows us to connect our fairly extensive system. And, and at a later point, we'll, we'll kind of zoom out and show what that, that regional system looks like. But, uh, um, um, but let's stay in there for, for the time being. The uh, number of trails that we had coming into this area, starting clear back in, in uh, we've been uh, planning for this area since we did a, a study and a plan with uh, Lehigh City back in about 2010 um, for a comprehensive bicycle pedestrian network within the city and started building trails and connections into this area uh, quite a while ago, long before this ever came uh, to this project ever came to fruition. <clears throat> the interesting part in my mind was that as UDOT sat down with us and began to explain this project to us uh, at our region and local level is that we found out that we were not ready for this project that our plans were not did not were not comprehensive enough to really take advantage of what could be done here and so I have to give so much credit to UDOT and especially to Terry Newell for bringing in that group from outside and getting us all to sit down together and reimagine, after all the work that we've been doing for so many years, uh, imagining active transportation in Utah County, reimagine what could happen in this area. And that reimagination brought us to this point. And I think this is going to be a showcase. This is a huge win for our region. It's a huge win for Utah County, for Lehigh City. And I think it's a huge win for UDOT because this creates a crossing and a system that is like no other that I know of in Utah um, and connects six trails that we've been building all around this area into each other and, and uh, creates a north-south, east-west system that, um, again, we'll get into a little bit later. But um, so been working on this, been, been 
doing this with MAG for, I'm in my 22nd year. Um, coming up to this has taken a long time and we were ready to take advantage of it um, because we've been building all these, all of these trails and facilities coming into this area, but actually sitting down and partnering with UDOT uh, was the key to making the actual project work uh, in the way that it has. And I, <clears throat> I really cannot say enough about how the partnership with UDOT turned out on this. I'm, I'm proud of it. I'm proud of them. Um, come see it when you can. It's an amazing, it's an amazing piece. There are parts still under construction. We have a bridge uh, that's crossing SR92 on the east side that connects the route right about where that TH sign was actually a trailhead sign. So just a little bit to the west of that. Uh, there's a trail that runs north and south along the east side of I-15 called the uh, Utah Southern, historic Utah Southern Rail Trail or the Lehigh Rail Trail, which is a lot easier to say. And through the Tiger Grant, we uh, were able to secure about $6 million to put a bike pad bridge across SR-92 to connect the north and south. And that is a key piece of this infrastructure that will be completed next spring. Uh, with that, uh, I'll kind of back, uh, go over to Kim and let him take from there. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'm excited to be part of the panel today. Um, this, uh, yeah, I would echo everything Jim said. This is really a project we're excited to have and, and it's, it's definitely been kind of a culmination of lots and lots of planning that's happened over many years um, with not only MAG but, and then UDOT and UTA. And I think we'll talk a little bit more about the whole collaborative process. Um, but yeah, uh, we're, we are super excited to have this kind of network. Um, this area right here, you know, I've always thought, you know, if you had a, a target and you visualize where the bulls act for as far as growth and just economic activity and 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 residential this area right here you know around the sr92 interchange kind of between 2100 north and, and the timpanogos highway is kind of the bull's eye i mean it's the center of the target um so yeah i've got a couple of slides here just to illustrate um how much growth is happening so this is west of I-15 and if you've driven out in that area you, you know there's a lot in fact this is probably definitely the lion's share of all of the growth that's happening in Lehigh uh, as far as residential is out on this west side so you know I've just got uh, several of the bigger projects out there labeled and yeah you've got you know 6,500 units that are in some form of uh, and, and a lot of those are already in the ground now uh, and then I think the next slide is uh, on the east side. Uh, you've got Traverse Mountain, which, you know, I think everybody's well aware, you know, that covers uh, all the way from the, the commercial area down by the outlet mall, and then it goes up into those low hills. And I, we're estimating we're probably about 2,500 units, residential units that have been built out of 5812. So there's, we're not even quite halfway on the number of residential units that will be built. And then to the east of that, which is, you know, still in this same area, we've got Micron. This is a master plan that they adopted uh, several years ago, but, and they're probably, they're looking at, uh, they're, they're gonna probably redo their master plan, but this will be another 1100 units. So we're looking at, you know, almost 7,000 units on the east side of the freeway <laughs> as well. So there's just so much activity and like I said, this tech corridor was really kind of the convergence where all of this is coming together with jobs and people and uh, Thanksgiving point and all of their amenities and everything going on right here. So I think the next few slides are just, uh, I did want to point out um, this, I feel like was a very key piece to the whole tech corridor project. In fact, this was the first thing that they built was the Triumph uh, 
uh, overpass over the freeway. And, um, you know, we talked a lot about the active transportation. We were this bridge, you know, bridges are very expensive to build. And we had a lot of discussion, a lot of different ideas. You know, at one point, it, you know, we thought we weren't going to be able to get any kind of a pedestrian connection over it because, you know, every foot that you widen the bridge, the cost goes up exponentially. But we were able to preserve, we have bike lanes planned and you have now a way kind of in the middle of this whole area to get over the freeway. It's it's not quite as comfortable as, as our crossings that you saw uh, under the freeway at the um, Timpanogos Highway, but, it, but it's there and it, you can use this. And, and yeah, we just feel like the east and west sides, it was so important to create as many links as we could. Um, and uh, yeah, there's, you've seen a lot of this in the, in the little video. I, th I thought that was really helpful to see the, the GoPro, but yeah, this is the underpass underneath that uh, Triumph Bridge so that you can get, you know, underneath a, a major arterial road without having to go up and cross it at grade. Um, I think some of the other pictures, these are um, some that we've seen on the GoPro. This is, if I wish I had a before and after of the, uh, this is the I-15 underpass for the Murdoch Canal Trail. Um, but yeah, this is so much nicer. It feels very comfortable. Like um, Heidi said, you know, I'd be very comfortable taking younger people on this. And then I think the, the last few slides are similar, just some pictures um, as you come across on the east side of the freeway. But yeah, it's, it was so nice to have uh, a way to get back and forth across the freeway because you have a lot of, you know, collaboration and even lunch traffic you know there are restaurants on uh, the both the east and the west sides but you know everybody always has different preferences and, but now instead of having to get in your car hopefully you know when it's warm or when it's nice outside people can go and walk and and have these other opportunities for active tran transportation but yeah I'll talk more about the collaboration that took place between the city and UDOT and UTA uh, but it's been, yeah, lots of great planning for many years. And this is, you know, kind of, the, and there's still more to do, right? And with that, I'll pass it to Mary. Good morning. Um, I'm thinking back on my history with First and Last Mile, and I see uh, my pal, Dan Bergenthal, um, as one of the participants. Um, before I came to UTA, I've been at UTA a little over four years. Dan and I were commuters on Front Runner, and we used the green bike as our first and last mile. And we used to compete with each other to see who could get the most miles on the leaderboard for the top 10 riders of the green bikes. And I think Dan cheated because he would go out and just ride the green bike during lunch, ride laps. But anyway, um, it was a wonderful addition to transit for me. I was commuting from American Fork to downtown Salt Lake, working for Salt Lake City. Without that last first and last mile connection of Green Bike, uh, the transit would, became very problematic and difficult. And that's generally true, is transit becomes more valuable when we have good first and last mile. And active transportation, transportation of course, plays a key role for all of that. One of the things that Kim and I and Mag and UDOT have been working on is bringing a bike share program to this tech area so that these new facilities that everybody just pointed out can get people to the train. But there's some other projects that are going on and things that happened as really a follow-up to this project. I came to UTA and my first couple of weeks I attended the Smart Growth Workshop and I thought, well, wow. <laughs> We're really innovative in Utah County. We know how to collaborate and plan together and work together. And that sort of set the pace for all the work that I have done at UTA to date in working with the other organizations, the city, MAG, UDOT. Um, we've really developed really, I think, productive and wonderful partnerships and learned how to work together and make things happen. And certainly this project is evidence of this in a, in a major way. A couple of things that came as a consequence of that smart growth workshop is we met 
um, sort of informally with business partners and the city and UDOT and MAG and tried to figure out what we could do to enhance transit in the area as the project was under construction. We had a small window of opportunity where uh, travel was so miserable that we could encourage people to take transit in a way that they may not have considered before. And so we added two bus routes, one that went east and west and one that went from the, tr from the train station east and west across the freeway. And we also added one that went up to the outlets from the train station up to Adobe and then connected up to tracks at the Draper Town, town Center. Uh, coronavirus put a damper on that project and we were just a year into piloting what that looked like. But one of the things that we learned is, and we knew, but it, it reinforced is the importance of active transportation. So much of the area, particularly on the east side, doesn't um, lend itself well to transit travel, to buses. Difficult for our buses to travel um, in some of those areas and finding ways for the people to hop on a bike or walk and get to transit was really critical to us. So we'll see after we all get vaccinated, what happens to the tech area and what needs we have. In the meantime, we have a couple of things going on that we're thinking about. One is certainly the micro transit project in South Salt Lake. Um, all of us are watching that eagerly and trying to figure out when we're gonna get it into Utah County. And the tech area is one thing, one area where we're considering and looking at data to see is, would that be helpful? So probably most of you know about microtransit. It's very much like Uber, except for instead of picking you up at your house, it might pick you up at the corner and also has accessible vehicles. So people with disabilities can take care of that first and last mile in a unique and important way. And that's new for UTA. We have high hopes the pilot in South Salt Lake County has gone very well, even during uh, coronavirus days. And I just saw some data yesterday that is encouraging to us to continue to look at that. So while that's not funded, that's something that I think we're gonna be paying attention to in the tech corridor. And we have UTA folks who have, are looking at the data about where that makes sense and how that might be a solution. A major transit project that we are working on collectively with UDOT. UDOT is actually our project manager, and that is the Central Corridor Transit Project. It's our next bus rapid transit uh, possibility, and that would go from Provo to Lehigh, uh, probably connect at Adobe, and hopefully connect to the Point of the Mountain Transit Project. It's a major, major project, two and a half times the UVX system. Um, it will need to have active transportation all the, along the way in order for that to be successful. And it would replace our 850 line. We have high hopes about that moving forward. It was initiated by the seven cities that are in that corridor from Provo to Lehigh. And we're just looking, finishing up our locally preferred alternative. And we'll be venturing into the environmental and that will have a major impact on the high tech, on the tech corridor and the improvements that have been done. What I really love is the cooperation and partnership, and it's a true partnership between the cities, UTA, UDOT, and MAG, but most importantly is it's being led by the cities and that they're shaping how this project is going to take place and how that's going to move forward. And to me, that's, that's key to all the success of everything that we do. So I'm going to stop and let someone else See, Eileen wants to hurt us somewhere else. All right. Thank you, Mary. And I think what, you know, what we're hearing is, you know, there was a lot of great planning that helped enable uh, this most recent construction project to be implemented, but there's a lot more planning to be done. Um, and I think we've set a tone of collaboration. Um, you know, the work that Mountain Land Association of Governments has done in bringing all those local governments to the table and establishing a regional vision. And now how Mary is able to build on that in terms of um, building a long-term vision for transit in Utah County as well. Um, so I wanna have the group uh, talk a little bit more about the long range planning component of this. So how did that long-term active transportation planning and collaboration 
help to facilitate better outcomes for the integration of pedestrian and bicycle facilities and transit service improvements as part of the I-15 technology corridor construction project. And Jim, I'd like to give you a chance to respond first. Great, thank you, Eileen. If you will, <clears throat> the long range transportation planning that we have been doing for the last couple of decades in uh, Lehigh and in Utah County laid the groundwork for this to be successful. Uh, it brought together the communities. <clears throat> we talk about, let's talk about just one facility with the Murdoch Canal Trail. That's fairly well known. Um, it's a beautiful facility. I, I've worked on that almost my entire career at MAG. Um, we opened it in 2013 after about uh, 15 years of uh, very, very hard work and a lot of money, it was, a, it was a big project, about $20 million to get that all on the ground in, in, in one fell swoop, which we'll never do that. We'll never do something like that again, I don't think. We just don't have the opportunities in the right of way. But we planned on that with, with the seven cities that it runs through uh, to make that happen in Utah County over that 15 years. And it ends up being the major connection across I-15 to connect the east side of Lehigh where Traverse Mountain is to the west side of Lehigh where all those developments on the west side of, of, uh, of the river, of Jordan River are now going in and, and the thousands, if I say, dare say tens of thousands of residential units that uh, Kim was talking about, those were not, those were not there just a few years ago. And it took the real vision of, of Lehigh City to see what they wanted their city to be. It took the vision and um, collaboration of UDOT over time to see how they wanted to better fit in and better accommodate cities in what their visions were locally. And MAG, of course, that is our, that's our job. That's what we do. That's what we, we try to bring everybody together and envision a different, or, or I can say to bring our differing visions to the table and reconcile them to see what works for everybody. And this process like uh, we've been talking about has been going on for a very, very, very long time. <clears throat> and had we not been working that process, had we not been developing those relationships, had we not been developing that, that culture of collaboration over many, many, many years, I doubt that this would have happened. This, this didn't happen in a, in a vacuum. This happened in a, with, with colleagues <clears throat> and um, uh, co-workers, people that we know, people that we trust and have come to trust in different agencies and different communities that uh, without that, that shared vision, this, this would not have happened. Um, and I think that is probably the most important thing to me that comes out of the long range planning effort is that we begin to see each other's visions and we begin to uh, see a common outcome that works for everyone. And we, we build trust, we build um, communication lines and that's what makes this happen. Yeah, I think that's the perfect um, transition over to Kim and hearing from Lehigh City as a local government participant. Um, you know, talk about the synergies um, that the synergies that um, were already in place and maybe wouldn't have occurred if we didn't already uh, work together. Um, say something about collaboration and your role as a local government, Kim. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to talk about that there. Yeah, um, you know, as I think how all this did come together, like Jim was describing, I mean, 
just to kind of put some of the pieces, you know, that have all come together to describe that. So you had the Jordan River Parkway, which years ago, you know, the county had the vision to put a trail along the river, but, and that was kind of the first really large regional trail that came through Lehigh. But then working with MAG, you know, we started to, uh, we, we got the Murdoch Canal Trail, the rail trail, um, and then we, through MAG, we were able to get funding to do our own bike and pedestrian master plan, which is, you know, basically our active transportation plan. And that was in 2013 uh, in that range. And that's, you know, before that, we didn't really have a plan for bike lanes or, or and how did all of our trails tie in regionally. Um, and so that really helped us take a look at the bigger picture. Um, but yeah, even up to most recently with the Tiger Grant Bridge. So there's so many things that we've been working through with MAG concurrently. And then with UDOT, I think a lot of that collaborative, it just seems like, it, and you know, the UDOT folks I'm sure would concur that there's been such a, and it's great, such a bigger focus in the last several years. It really even going back to 2100 North when that was constructed through Lehigh and we had a trail that we put on the north side all along 2100 North because I think everybody realized, well, this is a really big road. It's, pro you know, we need to be thinking a little bit more about, you know, it can't just have a sidewalk. We need something more along some of these bigger corridors. But yeah, then we get, when we get to the actual tech corridor, uh, you know, those, that mindset and, and the relationships were there um, where, you know, we sat down and, and the tech corridor was a design build. And so the, as it was happening, we were sitting down with UDOT and we were getting Jim's input on, hey, how do we design this underpass so that it's comfortable? And, you know, how do we get it completely grade separated? Uh, I think the Smart Growth America workshop that UDOT sponsored was, was, to me, a huge piece of all this. And we've kind of already talked about it, but I remember I was at the workshop and that was the one thing that still sticks in my mind is I, and we went out and they said, okay, they had us in different groups. And they said, try to walk to this location and another group and this other location. And you would go out and there would be a sidewalk that just dead ended uh, or you were crossing these big roads with really no good pedestrian crossing. Um, so anyways, that was a huge part of it. And, and I think that's what brought a lot in. MAG was a participant in that and UTA but it just got us thinking in this mindset. But yeah, and then Mary's mentioned, but you know, we're still right now collaborating with our transit corridor that will basically parallel through this, this whole area. But um, yeah, yeah, it's been great. We've got uh, uh, UDOT actually contributed some seed money towards active transportation. And we're gonna try and implement that for, with a bike share program. There's just so many things that have all come together working with all of the agencies. It's been great. Yeah, Mary, say some more about the collaboration. I think you've um, really been a champion for this collaborative process. Well, I, I wanna say something about relationships and it's probably obvious, but it's important and critical. Jim talks about it, Tim talks about it. That is when I have a relationship and like I know Jim and find out all the good things he's worked on and how smart he is. When I see him do something that doesn't make sense to me, instead of saying, what a bad guy and he's out to get me, I think, oh, something must have happened. I must have misunderstood, Jim misunderstood. Because I have a relationship with Jim, I'm gonna think about that differently instead of starting to do sides like mags against me. Uh, Mag hates transit, which neither of those are true at all, right, Jim? So having relationships, individual relationships really colors how we think about issues. And from a, a collective perspective, when we all know each other and sort of understand where, where each other's coming from, we forgive each other and give each other a chance when something doesn't look right. And we enter the conversation in a different way. And as simple as that sounds, I think it's absolutely critical to having a bigger and better outcome. Um, and it also allowed us to come together, having that smart growth workshop, you know, pulling back from on the ground and looking at the bigger perspective of what we wanted to do collectively, separate from our own organizations, helped us have that collective vision and then 
having good relationships with each other. We could talk about what could be our role um, in making this happen in a new and different way. And I really think that workshop was critical to the success of what's happened today. The only thing that I would do different is I'd be much more obnoxious about getting a bus only lane over those bridges. So I was new on the job and I'm just telling you, next time I'm gonna, I, I won't go down easy on that one. And we actually talked about that. That was one of the alternatives in the workshop was making it so someone said, hey, what about if the bus could, just the bus and bikes could go over on that bridge. It's super expensive. It would have been a game changer. Uh, but we do have other alternatives for um, getting that, <coughs> excuse me, first to last mile, <coughs> excuse me, to happen. Yeah, and I, what I love about that, Mary, is we still, you know, this project is an accomplishment, but we still have dreams and wishes and know there's always, there's space for improvement and other, other approaches, right? Other um, ways to think about how to design efficient transit, attractive transit, um, in addition to the first mile, last mile connections for people who may be biking or walking. Um, so, uh, wanting that only bus lane. Sorry, I'm like a dog with a bone on the bus only bus. I'm having a bus only bus lane. Is actually fundamental to the central corridor transit project that we're working on right now, that Kim was talking about, and in that we're looking at having most of that project be exclusive lanes, and east of the freeway we would be using the rail corridor that UTA owns, and that would allow for that that bus exclusive um, ride to happen. Hey, Mary, do you wanna maybe put in the chat if people wanna learn more about that central corridor study, um, let's maybe give them a link to learn more. And um, while she's doing that, I'm gonna give Heidi a chance to talk a little bit about key takeaways and lessons learned from this whole process. Again, focusing on the planning process and the collaboration it took to arrive at the outcomes that people are able to use today. And um, Heidi, maybe in the midst of that, you see some of the things happening in the chat. Um, I'll, I'll listen for uh, whether you could address some of these. I know that's a lot to ask, but I think you've read some of the chat that's coming in. So yeah. um, talk to us about the lessons learned and what we can replicate um, out of this experience. Yeah, so um, one of the major lessons learned that's just like popping into my head as I reflect back on our workshop, all of the work that I've done with, you know, the project team, the construction team, seeing this thing kind of go from concept to built infrastructure is um, taking a chance to sit down and listen. Had UDOT gone in and said, we're just going to build a roadway, we're not going to collaborate, we're not going to listen to the needs of the city of Lehigh, of UTA and Front Runner, or of MAG, we would have missed out on tremendous opportunities that we've kind of accomplished with this project. Um, something that, you know, kind of uh, carried through in the design process for this project was we don't want to just accommodate people because we can, you know, we can consider their use, we can accommodate their use, but we want to encourage people to bike and walk. And to do that, we have to really elevate the type of infrastructure that we're providing as a part of this project. And um, you know, when we're thinking about how do you encourage someone to walk, it has to be safe, it has to be friendly, uh, it has to be very comfortable and kind of a good way to get from point A to point B. So that walking along this pathway to go to lunch or to get from the transit center to your job um, becomes a joyful experience or enhances your quality of life or gives you the opportunity for physical activity and health instead of just like, oh yeah, it's kind of a slog, it's not very pretty. I, there's like, I'm like waiting so frequently for all of these stops. It takes me so long to get there. Now we've kind of reduced some of those barriers that kind of are excuses for people to not walk and bike. And, you know, now that we have other things like e-bikes, monowheels, electric scooters, kind of these really fun micro mobility modes, uh, the opportunities for people to get out and see this area differently and not automatically turn the key to their car um, is, is something that I think, you know, is what we all want at the end of the day. And, um, you know, going back to that key takeaway, it's just sitting down and listening to what the needs are and understanding 
what the needs are and how we can provide solutions for them. Um, going into our Q&A section, uh, Dave Viltis has asked what UDOT and the tech area have done to make crossing I-15 corridor by bike. So I'll just kind of summarize. We had, you know, the Murdoch Canal Trail on one set side that was accommodating um, and getting people through the uh, interchange, and we've elevated that. So um, now instead of having four different grade separated crossings in the interchange with on ramps, high speeds, turning vehicles, blind corners, we now have two pedestrian bridges and ramps that access them. So it's totally grade separated. That has gone from kind of a stressful biking and walking environment to completely low stress, um, grade separated. Um, so that's at the SR92 interchange. If you go down to Triumph, the new bridge, uh, that has uh, another structure, a pedestrian and bike tunnel that accommodates the frontage road trail so that there's no kind of grade changes to get up and over the, the, the new bridge. Um, and then it also has trail and connections across it that are very comfortable. There's barriers separating you from the travel lanes. Um, so it feels very comfortable and you're protected from the roadway. Um, additionally, all the way down at kind of the southern aspect of this project, we have really good tie-ins with the uh, the 2100 North uh, trail system. And so kind of the intricacies of how those tie together, how it's really easy to make, you know, on and off movements for all of the trail systems. Um, so we've we've gone from, you know, kind of one bike lane accommodation at, at you know, 2100 um, and kind of one trail accommodation at SR92 to now we have three grade separated crossings um, at all three of those locations, which is very exciting and helps improve that east-west connectivity um, with I-15. So. Wayne, do you mind if I jump in just for a second here? Because mm -hmm. this, right I, wanna, ahead. I wanna play off of what, just exactly what Heidi was talking about. And can I share my screen with everybody? I wanna share this, this map that, um, we gave links to, and I'm gonna zoom in on, this is the existing, these are existing facilities here in Utah County. I'm going to zoom in onto that picture that we looked at earlier before. And this is the I-15 project that we're talking about with these three new crossings of I-15. With all, with the red, these are all paved trails. The purple are bike lanes. Uh, and buffered bike lanes out here on Redwood Road. What I want to do just for a second is zoom out from this connection. Now you see, you see how central this is and how important this is, but wait till we zoom out a bit into the rest of the county and the rest of the region and see just exactly how important that is because it connects the east side of Utah County with the west side of in, in the existing trail system. And again, this is existing, this isn't the plan. This is what we have on the ground right now. Eagle Mountain, Saratoga Springs, Lehigh, American Fork, uh, Highland, Cedar Hills, Pleasant Grove, Linden, Orem, Provo, all the way down to Springville is a connected system. And then again, up to Provo Canyon. And without that, without this piece, none of that would be continuous. And now it is, and it's, it's um, a lot of miles of continuous, safe, comfortable, which is the key thing that, and that Heidi brought up that is the absolute key thing to getting people to bike and walk, uh, unless they're the, the crazy ones like Matt Parker at Region 3. He'll ride anywhere and, and do anything at any time. Uh, but if you're relatively normal, uh, like me, I like to ride on the trails because I feel safe. And I, I feel safe with my family and uh, with friends on those facilities. Uh, and that's what works. Okay, I'll stop sharing here. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I, I think that's one of the big takeaways is that, um, hopefully as we continue forward that we look at these things as not just an accommodation, I think like Heidi had put it, but it's an amenity. It's, it's a, 
a priority and and so that it's not all just about cars but it's you know you're actually creating facilities that people want to use that it's actually fun or enjoyable to be on yeah i i just want to add i i hadn't ridden a bike since i was probably 12 when i started riding the green bikes and um i hauled kim out there on the buffered lane in salt lake and i, I felt safe doing it when I had a protected bike lane. Um, certainly I wasn't ready for just a regular bike lane in downtown Salt Lake until I'd had that experience. And, and then after I've been on the green bike while, a while I got uh, more willing to ride anywhere. But that buffered bike lane really, I always feel like I'm the lowest common denominator. If I could ride green bikes in downtown Salt Lake, anybody could ride them. They certainly could ride them in the tech corridor. And that's, I think, the goal that we're working for is, is continuing to build that comfort level that Kim and, and Jim talked about. And by the way, I forgot to give credit. UTA, through your funding, Mary, uh, that was how we actually put the very first bike lane that we ever had in the city on Ashton Boulevard. That buffered bike lane was was from some money that UTA had available and they put on some bus stops. But yeah, th that's part of this ongoing collaboration. Well, and that's what exactly, you know, the panel today is, you know, just a slice of the collaboration that's been going into this area, area of Northern Lehigh and the Silicon Slopes Tech Corridor area. And that um, together recognizing there are pieces that the city can bring to the table and that UTA can bring to the table and MAG can help facilitate and UDOT can help with. So, um, you know, just to, to bring us to a closure um, that the collaborative, uh, the collaboration starts in the planning process um, and looking at the regional connectivity as well as the local network. Um, and, and I think that, um, the process that we undertook here for the tech corridor is a great example of how we put that planning into action, into implementation, and how the, you know, the benefit of those long-term relationships and the collaboration over time allowed this group of stakeholders to be nimble and making adjustments and really maximizing what could be accomplished um, when this design build project came along. So thank you all, uh, Kim, Jim, and Mary, as well as Heidi for being here today to share the story. And Heidi, I wanna give you a chance to just uh, finish us off with a few messages from Move Utah. Yeah, again, thanks to all of our panelists and our moderator, Eileen, today for um, coming together for this webinar and showcasing some of our collaborative planning work that's led to some really awesome infrastructure in the state of Utah. Um, like to recap, we're going to again have a series of webinars over the next few months uh, because we can't meet in person, we can meet virtually and kind of share what we're doing with the Move Utah program and active transportation at UDOT. So stay tuned, we'll be following this webinar up with kind of a recap and a survey. We'll also be posting uh, the webinar if you want to share it with friends or colleagues, um, it'll be on the Move Utah website and the transcript will be available as well. So um, I think that that's all. Uh, thank you so much for your time and for tuning in and asking your questions in the chat. Hopefully I've been able to get to all of them. Um, if not, please feel free to follow up uh, to, with an email to me, h-g-o-e-d-h-a-r-t at utah.gov and I'm happy to respond. Okay, thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs>